So if you have Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <laughs> this morning's just funny. <clears throat> uh, so last time we were talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, or at least given an overview of the book of Corinthians. And uh, what I'd like to do in this particular session is actually dive into the first several verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And again, the reason I wanted to even look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is that Paul is doing a very intriguing thing. He's talking to this early church in Corinth who ironically resembles our modern culture probably too much. I mean, it is a sports-obsessed culture. It is a sexually perverted culture. Uh, everything is permissible in Corinth. I mean, everything is just, I mean, it just sounds like our culture. And in the midst of his culture, he's reverting back and talking about ancient Israel, and he's using the Old Testament as an example of why we, both Corinth and us in our modern generation, is not to engage in idolatry. Uh, when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it's kind of split nicely in half. Uh, the first 13 verses is this idea of the example of Israel, and it's really a warning against idolatry. And so again, we'll be walking through this. This is what we're going to be primarily focusing on. But we'll be looking at these first 13 verses saying, what, what was this illustration? What was the, is the is example from the Old Testament? And why is Paul using that for his illustration for, against idolatry? But that's tied in with the last several verses of chapter 10, which is talking about the, the spiritual danger of idolatry. And one of the things that Paul says is that when we engage in idolatry, it is a participation with demons, which is a rather intense declaration. And we're not going to dive so much into that section. <clears throat> I just want to bring that up just so it's in the back of your mind. That one of the reasons why Paul's bringing this up is that it's not just in the natural realm or the physical realm that idolatry is serious. The physical realm is affecting the spiritual realm. And again, the spiritual realm is affecting the physical realm. But when you engage in idolatry, there is a spiritual reality that you are participating and engaging in the demonic. Which makes sense because it's all about rebellion, rebellion and independence uh, from God. Uh, what I'd like to do is look at the first several verses with you this morning uh, in this section. And it's all about this idea of the provision that Israel needed. Or in one sense, the provision that God provided to Israel. So let me just read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Uh, this is what Paul says. He says, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them. And that rock was Christ. It's an interesting way to start a section on idolatry. Because I would look at this and go, what does this have to do with anything about idolatry? It's like Paul just looking back to the Old Testament going, remember that time our forefathers had all this crazy stuff happening? Yay. I mean, it almost has this weird disassociation with idolatry. But what I want to do is I want to walk through this a little bit with you and kind of clarify some of what Paul is saying and then I want to tie it in and why is this so significant to this idea of idolatry? When you start walking through the first four verses of chapter 10, what you begin to realize is that God was supplying everything that the Israelites needed. And let's just walk through a few of these. For example, you have this idea of the cloud. And when you look at this idea of the cloud in verse 1, it's this idea of direction and shelter. <clears throat> so we are told that when, when Israel left Egypt, right, they're, they're coming and they're being led to the Red Sea, and then eventually they're being led throughout the wilderness— we are told that they were being led by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, which is this whole idea of direction. But it's also profound to me to realize that God gave a cloud by day and fire by night. And you could say, well, it's so that they can see it. And, you know, if you had a cloud by night, that would be a little awkward, you know. It's like, where is it? Right? It's dark. So a fire does make sense. But do you realize how beautiful this is in terms of the provision of God? The idea of, of the sheltering of God? They're in the middle of a desert. And if you've ever been in, 
a desert, like a true desert, it's interesting, the days are incredibly hot. So what do you need? Covering. You need shade. So what did God provide the Israelites? He gave them shade. He gave them a cloud. But in the middle of a desert, at night, it gets really cold, strangely. So what do you need in the middle of the night? Warmth. So he has a fire. So it's not just this idea of direction, something that we can see. It's this idea of this provision of shelter and protection against the elements. In other words, if I'm walking in the middle of a desert, I need, I need shade in the day and I need fire, warmth at night. And God is supplying all of that in this symbol of the cloud. Uh, let me just give you a few Old Testament passages just in light of all this. Exodus 13, verse 21, it says that the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. So again, it's there for direction. <clears throat> Psalm 105, verse 39 says, he spread a cloud for a covering and a fire to illuminate by night. And so you have this idea that in the midst of the cloud, there is this direction idea, and you have this idea of this shelter or this provision of illumination uh, as well as the heat and the, and the coolness thing. Uh, when you come later on in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians, uh, you, you find this idea of the Red Sea. And what is this sea all about? Well, obviously the sea parted and they walked through it, but it's all about this idea of protection and deliverance. Egypt the army of Egypt is coming up behind them. They have nowhere to go. How are they going to get across? So God, of course, makes a way and gives protection to the Israelites. He gives deliverance to them through the sea. So, for example, in Exodus 14, verse 22, it says that the sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on the right hand and to the left. A few verses later, it says, So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak, while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. Then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. He delivered Israel through the sea. Which is this beautiful idea, by the way, it's a great picture of a baptism, that the, the stronghold of the enemy, the, the ties that have tied us to our sin are broken. And that when we come up out of the water, we, in a sense, come through the water, and yet our old life remains. And it's actually a great picture uh, that Peter uses. I think it's in First Peter, Second Peter. He uses the, this, this idea and, and Noah's Ark as a picture of this idea of baptism. So when you come to this idea of the sea, Paul is saying, hey, just as our forefathers found this deliverance and protection through the sea, so have we. Just hold on to this. Uh, Nehemiah 9.11 says this, You divided the sea before them, so they passed through the midst of the sea on dry ground, and their pursuers you hurled into the depths like a stone into raging waters. And then he ties all of that in verse 2 to this idea of Moses. And when you look at this idea of Moses, you could almost summarize it by this idea of spiritual headship and blessing. That God was giving leadership and authority to the Israelites through this man by the name of Moses. Here's what one of the commentators said on this whole little section. It says, It is Paul who formulates the baptism into Moses, in imitation of the expression he will use about Christian baptism in Romans 6.3. He means only that the Israelites had in Moses someone anagalist, an, an, that word, yeah, that one I can't say, to Christ, into whom Christians are baptized. They are related to Moses through the cloud and the sea, just as Christians are related to Christ through baptism. So here's Moses leading the Israelites, and in one sense, they are intimately tied to this spiritual headship of Moses. Why? Well, because he was leading them th through the sea. And in a similar sense, we as Christians are not baptized into Moses, obviously. We are baptized into Christ, as Paul says in Romans. And there's this beautiful parallel that Paul is drawing on with this idea of just as the forefathers were, quote-unquote, baptized into Moses, so too we are baptized into Christ. And you're starting to get this idea that in the, Isra in the Israelite scene, God was the provision for everything that they needed. Let me give you a couple more. 
He goes in verse 3 and talks about food, that they ate the same spiritual food, which is this idea of nourishment, this idea of testing and instruction. For, for example, in Exodus 16, verse 4, the Lord says to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. So you know the scene, they're desperate for food. They cry out to Moses, and Moses goes, God, what, what are you going to do? And God says, oh, I have this incredible food. It's called manna. And of course, you know, comes up with a dew, and everyone looks at it, and they go, manna, which means, what is it? <laughs> and, you know, for the next 40 years, they eat, what is it? And apparently, they never figured it out because they kept calling it that for 40 years. So over the course of the 40 years, they, they have this nourishment. And isn't it interesting that they're required to partake, they're required to go out every single day to get the, what is it? And by the way, Jesus says that he is that manna that came down from heaven. That we need that daily pursuit. We need that daily apprehension of that food. And God says, hey, I'm going to provide the nourishment that they need. And in the midst of this, it's actually going to be a test and an instruction for you of whether you'll obey. So when you look at this idea of the food then, it's not just the nourishment for our physical sense, it's, it's also a testing and instruction in a spiritual sense. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, Moses is reminding the Israelites of what God has done, and he says, He humbled you, and he let you be hungry, and he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. That it is God who gives the provision. It is God who supplies the nourishment. And then he ties that to this idea of, of the water that came from the rock, which again goes back to this idea of provision, but it's also this idea of life. In Exodus 17, 6, it says, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you will strike the rock, speaking of Moses, and water will come out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So, of course, Moses took his staff, beat the rock, water pours out of the rock. Oh, could you imagine? Uh, in Psalm 78, verse 15, it says that he split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them abundant drink like the ocean depths. He supplied them life. He gave them absolutely everything that they needed. So when you step back, there is this idea that God was constantly supplying everything that the Israelites needed in the wilderness. And it may not be always what they wanted, but everything they needed, he provided. He gave them food, he gave them nourishment, protection, and direction. He, he, he supplied everything that they needed. So bring that into the book of Corinthians. Paul is using that as an illustration to talk about the provision of Christ. And he says, just as God supplied everything the Israelites needed in the wilderness, so too, O oh dear Corinthians, Christ has supplied everything that you need. In fact, Paul is very specific on this, even relating to the Israelites. And he says this at the end of verse 4 of chapter 10. He says, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. Do you hear what Paul is saying? This is so incredible to me. Paul is saying Jesus was with the Israelites in the wilderness. Now, there was a literal rock, and the rock literally flowed out water. But what is it referring to? Jesus. Jesus was their provision. Jesus was what those Israelites needed in the wilderness. That phrase, followed, followed them, that the rock followed them, I found this so intriguing. The rock followed them. Have you thought of, this is so, such a weird idea. And so here's what one commentator, he gives the two options for this uh, from Jewish tradition. But this was so interesting. Here, in identifying the rock that followed them, Paul builds on a rabbinical tradition that said that Israel was supplied with water by the same rock all through the wilderness. A rock that followed them. How crazy is that? 
Some Bible scholars today debate as if to the rock as to if the rock followed Israel or if the water followed Israel as in a stream. The point is, though, the same. Jesus Christ was present with Israel in the wilderness, providing for their needs miraculously. I actually like the rabbinical thought that here is this rock that just wherever they moved, the rock just, <laughs> just could you imagine how crazy that would be? It's no crazier than having a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night for 40 years. And that's no crazier than shoes not wearing out or not having to replace your clothing, which I've said before probably drove the women crazy. You know, because you're stuck with the same outfit and there's no shopping. But do you realize that the point of this whole thing is that Jesus supplied everything that they needed? It may not be what they wanted, but Jesus supplied everything that they needed. And Paul is using this as an illustration saying, hey, when you go back into the Old Testament, look at our forefathers. Here they were in the middle of the desert and God supplied everything that they needed. Yes, it may not be what they have wanted, but everything they needed was supplied. And he turns to the Corinthians and says, do you not realize that that is still the same? That Christ has given you everything. That Jesus has supplied absolutely everything that you need in this life. So here's the question. Why then, O Corinthians, are you turning to idols when Jesus has supplied your every need? You are actually doing the same thing the Israelites did when they turned to idols, even though God supplied all of their need. And we'll look more at this next time when we actually get into the idolatry section. But here's what I want us just to ponder this morning. There's this idea that we often have of saying, well, well, look, look what God is doing in our midst. L look at this. Shoes aren't wearing out. Manna in the wilderness. Water from a rock. Shoes don't, or uh, the, the clothing doesn't need to be replaced. We have all of this phenomenal movement of God. And yet, isn't it interesting that the same people who had all that supplied to them in the, in the wilderness still gave themselves over to idols? Here, here's Corinth, and that's Paul's argument. He's saying, look, I realize that God is doing some neat things in your, in your midst. God is doing these phenomenal movements and stirrings and and, he, and he's giving you gifts, and, he, and there's, but you're addicted to idolatry. You're wrapped up in sexual perversion, O Corinth. So just because you, you're seeing a movement of God in your midst doesn't mean you are safe from sin or idolatry. Here's verse 5. Here's what Paul says. After that whole thing, God provided everything they needed. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Do you hear Paul saying? Paul is saying, despite the fact that God gave them everything that they needed, God wasn't well pleased with most of them. Which, when you actually study this out, is actually humorous. Because when you actually look at, well, who was God pleased with? Imagine this. Scholars tell us that roughly you know, between one and three million Israelites left Egypt. Surely he can find some people that he's pleased with that actually walk in obedience. Paul says that most of them God was not well pleased with. We find out that there were two. There were only two out of all the people who left Egypt who got to enter into the promised land. So it seems like a funny irony or an ironic hyperbole by saying, I think God wasn't pleased with most of them. If I was Paul, I'd been like, yeah, none of them did well, except two. That's, that's most of them. Maybe you're not catching the funniness in this, but I think that's, I think that's hilarious. If you go back to the story, it's in Numbers chapter 13. The spies go in to spy out the land. 40 days later, they come back and they give the report. And at the end of chapter 13 of Numbers, 10 of the spies say, we can't do this. Yeah, it's all that God promised, but we can't enter in. 
And there's only two people who stood up and said, what are you, t- what are you talking about? God has promised. He is more than sufficient to bring us into the land of promise. And Joshua and Caleb stands in defiance of all of Israel. Here's what chapter 14 says. So right after all of Israel's like, no, we can't do this. It says that all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, oh, that we would have died in the land of Egypt, or that we have died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land only to fall fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. God has given them everything. They just walked through the Red Sea not long before this. And here they are saying, yeah, we can't trust God. Yeah, I, I, don't, think he's, I don't think he's capable. And they're shaking their fists in defiance to Almighty God. And so it says, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in the presence of all the assembly of the congregation of the sons of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh and those who had spied out the land tore, sorry, of those who had spied out the land tore their clothes and they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel. So there's only four individuals who see this as a crime. Now, Moses and Aaron are going to die in the wilderness. So only Joshua and Caleb are the ones who are standing and actually endure to the end. But listen to what they say. The land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Could you imagine the scene? Here's all of Israel saying, no, no, no. We're not buying it. And so God steps in. (laughs) Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. And there is rebellion in the land. And as you follow this through, because they rebelled, for every day they spied out the land, which is 40 days, they had to spend one year wandering in the wilderness. So for 40 years, they wander in the wilderness, and everyone is laid low. Everyone dies in the wilderness, except Joshua and Caleb. So listen to Paul's statement again. Nevertheless, though God provided all that they needed, with most of them, God was not well pleased. Yeah, that's an understatement. For they were laid low in the wilderness. Uh, New King James says it this way, but with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. It's a little bit more intense. The Amplified, I really like this one. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with the great majority of them. For they were overthrown and strewn down along the ground in the wilderness. And the idea is like God picked them up and just went, nope. And God just scattered them around the wilderness. Why? Disbelief. A lack of faith. Do you realize that we have the same problem? We have the exact same problem that Israel had We have the same problem that Corinth has. And that's Paul's point. He says in the very next verse, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6, he says, Now these things happened as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. The Amplified says it this way in the same verse. Now these things are examples, warnings, and admonitions for us not to desire or crave or covet or lust after evil and carnal things as they did. When you come into the book of Corinthians, it's interesting. God's been doing a movement. God's been stirring their hearts. There's been some spiritual breakthrough. Hey, there's these experiences. They're partaking of the Lord's Supper and they're walking through baptism and and they're, they're having these religious spiritual movements of God just like the Israelites did. Just as the Israelites had shoes that didn't wear out and clothes that didn't need to be replaced and manna 
and clouds and fire and water from a rock, so too the Corinthians were experiencing spiritual, a spiritual movement of God. Hey, look at us! Look, look at what God's doing in our midst! And yet, do you realize, here, here's, here's the concept. Just because you see evidence of God, whether it be Red Sea, manna, water from a rock, baptism, taking communion, whatever it may be, it doesn't mean you're walking in victory, godliness, and the fullness of the Spirit. You can experience God and yet still walk in sin and idolatry. That's a scary statement to me. And I think we in the modern church presume that, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I, I said the prayer. Oh, I've been baptized. I take communion. Hey, I mean, I've, I've, woo, I've, I just had an experience of God. Just because God has done something in our midst doesn't mean we're not prone to sin and idolatry. Just as Israel was susceptible to sin and idolatry, even though God provided all that they needed, so too Corinth is in danger. Because as you start working through the book of Corinthians, you realize they have some serious problems. They're feasting at pagan temples. They're engaging in sexual promiscuity of all degrading, uh, of all sorts of just twistedness and perversion. And you realize that the justification in their minds were, but we're Christians. Hey, we've done the religious thing. God's moving in our midst. So surely this is okay. Uh, there's a really scary passage in Matthew chapter 7. And I've already mentioned this to the, the students, but li listen to this. Jesus is talking at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But it is he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven who will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And I've said this before, but just because we declare, Lord, Lord, doesn't mean you're entering into heaven. Just because you say, well, well, Jesus came to earth and died upon a cross and rose again doesn't make you a Christian. Satan can say those things. Just, just declaring the name of God doesn't mean we have any surety or security. In fact, I would look at this list that Jesus gives. Look at this. Prophesying, casting out demons, performing miracles and wonders and signs. If we saw someone doing that, we go, whoa, super Christian, whoa, look at this, that's phenomenal. And all you need to do is get on YouTube and you see that. And there's this huge movement of, of all these miracles and wonders and signs and prophecy and everyone's just like, whoa, this is so phenomenal. And, but Jesus says, what actually matters is not the, it's the intimacy and he uses that word gnosko. It's that relational under, way of knowing and understanding. That I'm not just knowing about Christ. I am called to know Jesus. And Jesus says, you know what actually counts? You know what actually gets you in? Intimacy. It's not the miracles, wonders, and signs. And it's not the prophecy. It's not calling on my name. It's intimacy and relationship. Could you imagine going through your entire life and having these incredible movements of God in your life and having all these amazing experiences and being able to prophesy and cast out demons and do miracles, wonders, and signs. And I'm not downplaying those things. Those are great. God has given those. Praise the Lord. And we probably need more genuine realities of those in our generation. However, to use that as the proof of the movement of God in our life is actually a dangerous thing because that doesn't mean I have intimacy. That doesn't mean I actually have relationship. And do you know how sad it would be to go through your entire life and have the miracles, wonders, and signs, and prophecy, and casting out demons, and dying and still going to hell? And you say, well, God, look at what God is doing in our midst. Look at all the stuff that's happening. And yet Jesus says, but I never knew you. And the Corinthians were falling into that trap. God was stirring. God was doing a spiritual movement, 
And they're saying, well, look, God is in our midst. God is doing stuff. So therefore, we're okay. And we can live however we want. And Paul says, that's not true. Because if you're really walking with Christ, you cannot be walking in idolatry. You cannot be walking in sexual perversion. You cannot be walking in the things of this world. So look at Israel. God supplied all that they needed. And yet they were prone to idolatry. Corinthians, though God is doing stuff in your midst, you are walking in idolatry. Oh, modern church, though God is doing things in our midst, though there are some wonderful movements of God taking place, though there are miracles, wonders, and signs, prophecy, and casting out demons, you're still walking in idolatry. That we are called to be a pure and spotless bride, and yet the church today is anything but pure and spotless. I'm talking global. I'm not talking about an individual church. There's some great individual churches. But do you realize that we can say, whoa, look, God's doing stuff in our midst. And still be walking in sin. Still be dealing with idolatry. I, I love this passage in Second uh, Peter chapter 1. It, Peter's talking and he says, seeing that Jesus' divine power, think about this, has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them, get this, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Peter says that Jesus has given you everything that you need for life and godliness. That you get to be a partaker of his divine nature. And escaping the corruption in this world through lust. Jesus has supplied everything you need. Just as he supplied everything the Corinthians need. Just as he supplied everything, he was that spiritual rock that, that gave, uh, gave ancient Israel everything they needed in the wilderness. And yet, Paul says, Israel has become an example that even though God has supplied everything, they still turn to idolatry. Don't do it, says Paul. That we are to walk in holiness, in righteousness, in truth. That we are to be consecrated. We are to be known as saints. The one who are set apart and different from the world around us. Can I ask you, have you had that same attitude or that same perspective that says, well, yeah, but I'm fine. God's doing stuff in my midst. Look, man in the wilderness, quail in the bush, water from the rock, shoes that don't wear out, cloud by day, pillar by fire by night, go through the Red Sea. Woo! Look at the movement of God in my life. There's evidence of, of God in my life. Yeah, but are you, are you walking in sin? Are, are you living in addiction? Are you prone to idolatry? Again, idolatry, as we've been defining it, is turning to anything or anyone besides Jesus to meet my needs. Are you doing that? And just because you are spiritual, just because you go to church, doesn't make you immune to the propensity of sin and idolatry. So can I just freshly encourage you, as the writer of Hebrews encourages all of us, where he says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us throw off, let us lay aside every encumbrance, every weight, and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. If God's put his finger on anything, would you, as the writer of Hebrews says, will you throw it off? so that you can run this race called the Christian life well, keeping your gaze fixed on Jesus Christ.
and not distracted by the things of this world. Let's pray. Wow, Lord, I'm so convinced that you are absolutely everything that I need for life and for godliness. That you are to be central and preeminent in my life. And Lord, though I know that in my head, the reality is, is how does that play out in the everyday moments of my life? Because Lord, it is so easy to, to hearken back to some movement of you or some experience that we had in an altar or, or some movement in, in a church service and be like, well, yeah, but look at what God's doing in our midst. And somehow justify the fact that I can keep walking in sin, addiction, and idolatry. Lord, is it possible that you want to set us free? Is it possible like the Israelites in the wilderness where you were giving them everything that they needed where they didn't have to turn to the idols around them. They didn't have to craft a golden calf. Well, Lord, is it possible like the Corinthians that, yes, we're having these movements of God in their midst. Is it possible they didn't have to turn to all the junk around them in Corinth to find satisfaction in life? Lord, is it possible today not to get lost in the culture not to get lost in the, the perversion of this generation? Is it actually possible to walk in a purity and a holiness, living different and other than the world around us? Lord, perhaps we've never experienced it, but your word makes it clear it's possible. And Lord, if you say it, you cannot lie which means it's available to all of us. Lord, don't, don't let us hide our sin. Don't let us cloak our idolatry under the banner of spirituality. Showing the movement of you or the miracles or the prophecy or the casting out demons, but not actually having the life itself of Christ. Lord, would you bring us to a place of repentance? Lord, would you bring, bring your body to a place of seeing our desperate need for Jesus. Lord, you, you desperately desire a pure and spotless bride. And we are so marred and tainted with this world. And ultimately, Jesus, we, we cannot purify ourselves. The best we can pull off are, is but filthy rags. None of us are righteous which means we need you, the righteous Holy One, to come in and purify and sanctify and change and transform and set free and release. Lord, would you remind us that there are no sin too great, there is no bondage too strong, there is no addiction so, so tight in our life that you can't radically transform it. Lord, don't let us be like the ancient Israelites. Don't even let us be like Corinth. Lord, let us be like your bride as you desire her to be. So Lord, we need you. We desperately need you. Thank you for your life and your word. In your precious name.